Welcome to chapel. Let's stand and pray.
the opportunity to be able to gather here in this place today, Lord. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your sovereignty, Lord. You are good. You are so, so good. I thank you that you are the rock that we can stand on, Lord. I pray that you would just soften our hearts and prepare our hearts for the message today. It's in your name. Amen. Come on, somebody. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise in this place today? Would you turn to your neighbor, give him a high five, a hug, a handshake, tell him you look good. I've got a couple of quick announcements before I turn it over to Abby Kassebaum, our Director of Alumni Engagement. Uh, first, I wanna give a shout out to our dance Spartan Line team and our number 15 ranked co-ed cheer teams, which are down in Daytona. Right now, competing, dance is competing tonight, co-ed is competing tomorrow, so make sure that you guys are, are tuned in to the live results and all that stuff, praying for them. Uh, we're really, really excited and we're praying for you guys. Hopefully you guys are, are I'm sure you guys are tuned in from Daytona um, watching right now, so we're really excited. Um, and also, shout out to our number four ranked stunt team. They will comp be competing at nationals in Fullerton, California this next weekend. And then last but not least, next week is our last chapel of the year. It's Senior Chapel, one of my favorite chapels. It's awesome. Everybody's, everybody's gonna be up here in their regalia. We've actually got a senior, Caleb Little, Christian ministry uh, major who's gonna be bringing the word. It's gonna be awesome. And I'm gonna turn it over to Abby. She's gonna tell All you right. a little bit about Give Day. Yes, good morning, Spartans. Today is MBO Give Day. We get to celebrate the joy in giving to this amazing institution. So. Something you all may not know is 98% of our students here are on some sort of scholarship. So days like today go towards scholarships and making tuition affordable. Um, if you make a gift of just $10 or more students, you can get one of these scarves or our socks. There's 19 different initiatives you can give to. We're gonna be celebrating all day today in the perk at two with pretzels and outside of the chapel following with some more donuts and prizes. But who wants some t-shirts? I got some t-shirts to give away. Yeah. All right. Jenna's gonna come out here and film a video for us and I'm gonna throw out some t-shirts. All right. All right. Trace. All right, who wants? You gotta be, you gotta be excited. You gotta be excited. Oh, she stood up. Look, back there. Nice. All right, so, uh, oh, and here's our socks today. Um, Jenna is gonna do a video for us before Dr. Lumpkin comes out, and um, all you need to do is I'm gonna count down three, two, one, and then point at you, and then I need everyone to stand up, get excited, and say, it's give day, okay? Can we do it? Yeah. All right, so, tell me where you're at. All right, three, three two, two, one. one. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, thank all right. you all. Happy gift day. Yeah, thank you guys. All right, let's prepare our hearts and minds for our final installment of our four-week series to my friend who left the faith. Get after it. Uh, how's everybody? This is my little girl, Charlotte. She, how old are you? Three, yes. All right. So we got a future Spartan here. So on give day, you're giving to help make it possible for her to go to college one day. My wife, Sarah, and our other son, uh, Will, are here too. Can y'all give them a warm welcome this morning? Go get mom. Go that way. There you go. MBU is a family affair sometimes, so you have to celebrate the, the love, lovely children and the spouses that support us to do the, all the good work that we get to do here. Uh, thankful to see all of you here uh, this morning as we dive into our last uh, sermon, last uh, really week of chapel with our sermon series. Next week's gonna be a little bit different. It's gonna be senior chapel. We'll have seniors leading us in worship. Uh, our own uh, senior Caleb Little, wherever you are up here, is gonna be preaching for us. So we're excited for next week, so make sure you're here uh, as we uh, get ready for graduation. This is our last week, as I mentioned, for this series uh, to our, my friend who left the faith, and we've explored a number of 
reasons why people wrestle with the truth of Christianity. Can I really believe these things that I find in the Bible? We've talked about the things like problem of evil, the resurrection, and evidence that God actually exists. And today, we wanna conclude with this question, can we trust the Bible? Can we trust the Bible? Now, it's not uncommon to hear a variety of objections to the Bible uh, today. You might hear things like the Bible often contains numerous contradictions and inconsistencies. You may hear that the Bible depicts instances of violence, genocide, prejudice, injustice, often attributed to divine commands, and have historically even been wielded by Christians to rationalize the same type of behaviors. Sometimes the people point to the Bible's depictions of natural phenomena and historical events and how they are inconsistent seemingly with science. Some talk about how they are authored by ancient and primitive societies and how can that be perceived to even be applicable to a uh, sophisticated society that we live in today. And then that doesn't even include the disagreements that you find amongst Christians about how to interpret the Bible and what the Bible actually means. And so from this quick overview, we can say there's a lot to be said about each of these And to be honest, there are books and books and books and books written on this topic. So I cannot cover all of that in this moment today. But I hope that through our time together this morning, what you'll find is that there's a few simple reasons of why we can trust the Bible and it might encourage you to do some more reading for yourself. But before we do that, we're gonna read from Luke chapter 24 this morning, starting in verse 13. If you'll follow along with me, Luke 24, starting in verse 13, says this. Now, that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. And then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that are happening in these days? What things, he asked. And so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. This is God's word. Would you pray with me as we dive in this morning? Heavenly Father, thankful for your word this morning. Would you help it to be clear to us? What we do not know, would you teach us? What we have not, uh, please, Lord, give us. And what we are not, would you make us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So in this story, Jesus is, is shortly appeared to this group the day following his, the day of his resurrection. And a couple of the disciples are there, they're walking along this road to Emmaus as we just read, and Jesus appears to them, they don't recognize him and he begins to teach him and we get a picture of what's probably the greatest teaching, Bible teaching that there ever has been or ever will be. Jesus begins to explain to them what's in the Bible, what's in the text. Notice what it says in verse 27. Pop that back up on the screen if we have it. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Friends, if Jesus is who he says he is, then this passage has huge implications for us today because it tells us just of one aspect of Jesus' view of what we partially call the Bible today. It's all about him. And so I wanna spend our time thinking through these a few main ideas about why we can trust the Bible. We can trust the Bible in two ways, in history and in life. So let's start with why we can trust the Bible in history. Now, as we consider why the Bible can be trusted, 
throughout history. I want to give you a, an outline of an argument for why we can trust the Bible as a whole. Now, this comes from Norman Geisler, who is a, a great uh, apologist uh, of our day and age. And this is a common argument that you will find, but maybe you've never seen it before. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. Let's pop that up on the screen. First, God exists. When you come to the Christian faith, there's an assumption that God actually exists. Genesis one assumes that God exists because it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The second thing as a part of this argument is this, miracles are possible. We've talked about that with the power of Jesus coming back from the dead already, so we won't dive into that, but this uh, uh, illustrates that if God exists, then miracles are possible because God can do what he will. Third, we would see, say this is a part of this argument, that the New Testament is a historically reliable document. We don't have time to go into all of the details about that, but quickly I can just point to the fact that uh, if you were to compare manuscripts, particularly of the New Testament, we have nearly 6,000 manuscripts that go back to early forms of what that was written as. The greatest document after that, around that kind of antiquity type time that we have with the most copies is the Iliad, and that's less than 700. Okay, so you see the significance of how much evidence we can have just in manuscripts alone. The fourth part of this argument is this, that miracles confirm Jesus' claim to be God. Jesus could only do what he did if he were God. Fifth, whatever Jesus teaches is true. Because if the miracles prove that Jesus is God and we know that God is good and he cannot lie, he cannot speak ill true, uh, what that which is not true, he cannot speak lies, then that means whatever Jesus teaches is true. Number six, what Jesus taught is that the Bible is the word of God. And then finally, the conclusion is this, therefore the Bible is the word of God. Let me say it backwards. The Bible is the word of God because Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God. And whatever Jesus teaches is true because Jesus claimed to be God. He proved that through his miracles and we know that the New Testament historically gives us an account of what he actually did because miracles are possible and God exists. That's the logic. So Jesus affirms, though, the Old Testament, and he promises the new. I want to break down number six, right? This idea that Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God. Let's think about it in two ways. First, Jesus affirmed the Old Testament. Have you ever noticed in the scriptures when you're reading the New Testament that Jesus often alludes to the Old Testament and quotes it? He affirmed the authority of the Old Testament in a variety of ways. This included passages that he referred to the entirety of the Old Testament, at times, he recognized the various divisions, like the law and the prophets. Other times, he names individual books and identifies central events in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter five, he says, even the smallest letters of the Old Testament will not pass away. Jesus refers to the scripture as the word of God. Listen to what he says in John chapter 10, verse 35. Jesus answered them, isn't it written in your law, I said you are God's, he's quoting the Old Testament, if he called those to whom the word of God came gods and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you're blaspheming to the one the father set apart and sent into the world because I said I'm the son of God? Did you catch that? He's quoting the Old Testament and what does he call it? The word of God and the scripture. Okay, so he's affirming that these ideas actually exist. Jesus also confirms that the authors of the Old Testament were led by the Holy Spirit when they wrote down the oral tradition of what became the Old Testament. And he confirms authors like Moses, Isaiah, Daniel, and others. And he often cites events like creation, he cites events like the Sod Sodom and Gomorrah, and he reveals that these are true, historical, actual events. And that is because he saw the scripture as something that would endure forever. Luke chapter 16, verse 17, it says this, but it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the law to drop out. You see this? Jesus also is recognizing the significance of the scripture for day-to-day -day life. What does he do when he's in the wilderness? He quotes the Old Testament. What does he do when he hangs on the cross? He quotes Psalm 22 and Psalm 31. He sees how the scripture applies to life. It's not just an ancient book with historical information, we leave it in the past, but it's actually something that changes. It affects your life today. So Jesus not only promised the Old Testament and showed that it was authoritative and eternal and infallible, that it was without error, that it was true, that we can trust it, but he also promised the New Testament. 
Consider what he says in John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, listen, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. So what does Jesus do there? He promises that the Holy Spirit will help continue to teach them, but also to remember everything that he has told them. Likewise, consider John chapter 16, starting in verse 13 and 14. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he speaks on whatever he hears. And he will also declare to you what is to come. And he will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. What's he saying? That the spirit is the spirit of truth. That is, he will not lie, he will not deceive, he will not lead astray. And so as he leads the authors to write down what we have as the New Testament, that's a promise from Jesus that he is giving them the right things to write down, the right things to say. He's emphasizing the role of the Holy Spirit in establishing what we call the Bible today. So he's not only affirming the Old Testament, but he's promising what they would write down as they reflected back on what Jesus had taught them because they would be led by the Holy Spirit. And it's not simply the things that Jesus taught then. Did you catch it? What did it say? But what is to come? The Holy Spirit would guide them to help them understand all the things that would play out that we see from Genesis to Revelation, the promise of the new heavens and the new earth. Likewise, we can also point to the fact that what we see is that the Holy Spirit led the apostles and the apostles recognized this. Consider 2 Peter chapter one. It says this in verse 20. Above all, you know this, no prophecy of scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were, listen, carried along by the Holy Spirit. The apostles understood the fulfillment of Jesus's promise that Jesus would send his spirit to help guide them to remember the truth, to know the truth, even about the things that are to come. And so when they wrote these things down, they are inspired by the spirit and it is the truth of God being revealed to us. Now, the third thing I want us to think about as we think about the Bible in history and why we can trust it is the rise of the canon. Now, the canon is what we refer to as the Old and New Testaments. When we think about the Bible, that's a, the canon is the standard, the, the tradition of our faith. It tells us the truth about who God is and how we should follow him. Now, the Old and New Testaments can vary on tradition. Maybe you've noticed this. But if you were to compare a Bible in a Roman Catholic church to a Protestant church, you're gonna find some differences, okay? The Roman Catholic church includes, as a major difference, the Apocrypha, which are books from the intertestamental period, along with some certain Old Testament book additions like to Esther and some other things. Now, during the early church, the days immediately following the life of Jesus in the New Testament as described in Acts, what we find is the nature of the Hebrew Bible, right? We've already alluded to the Old Testament is fixed because when Jesus refers to the scripture, he's referring to the Old Testament. That would have been the Jewish scripture at the time. That's what he would have understood, what he would embrace, the 39 books of the Old Testament that we have. And this was divided into three different groups, right? The law, the prophets, and the writings. All of this should be familiar to you from New Testament class if you've taken that. The point here, though, is this, that it was a fixed canon. It wasn't up for debate. This was something that was already decided. And after the ascension of Christ into heaven and the apostles, they begin to proclaim the good news about Jesus. They begin to make disciples around the world. What the church has to do is this. They have to focus on recognizing the teachings that are accurate about Jesus. Because a lot of people are gonna have different opinions. Jesus interacted with all kinds of folks during his ministry, right? So they needed to know what can we proclaim is right about who Jesus is? How do we know what is actually true? There's a lot of miscommunication and confusion that arises. And that's why during this time, as people begin to spread false teaching about Jesus, we see the rise in early church history of the apologists. They rose up to defend the faith based on what the apostles had taught. These conversations centered around what was orthodox and what we would call heresy. Now, if you're unfamiliar with those terms, let me explain them quickly for you. Orthodoxy emphasizes the right worship of God. It's a dangerous thing to worship the right God the wrong way, just as it's dangerous to worship the wrong God, okay? So it's all about how do we worship God? It's about speaking about God the right way 
and saying and meaning the right things about God. Heresy, though, on the other hand, is what caused a separation of the right worship of God. It meant sometimes you say the wrong thing, and sometimes you say the wrong thing but mean the right thing, so we need to clarify that, but sometimes you say the right thing, but you actually mean something different, right? Here's some examples of this. Praxius was a a guy in the early church, and he uh, developed some ideas which would later become what we call modalism, that God was once father, then he became the son, then he became the spirit, but he was never all three at once. That's contrary to what the church would affirm with the doctrine of the Trinity. But he also taught this. Okay, here's a, here's a simple question. Y'all can answer this. Who died on the cross? Jesus. Okay, guess what Praxis said? No, it was the Father that died on the cross. Okay? So you get some teachings like this, and you're like, well, that, that's, that's not right. Okay, the apologists rise up. They say, no, we can't affirm that. That's not true about who Jesus is. It's not true about what happened, so we need to clarify that. So the church has to work through this early on. And all of this is because they're working to develop a common language, a common worship, and emphasize a common faith. They're building the culture of what it means to follow Jesus, right? One great scholar, Robert Louis Wilkins, said it this way, a decision about God was a decision about Jesus. Justin Martyr was a great leader and apologist, one of those that we referenced just a moment ago in the early church. This is what he said. Listen, you'll see it on the screen behind me. For I choose to follow not men or doctrines, men's doctrines, but God and the doctrines by him. What's his point? As they're navigating the early truths of Christianity, as they're reflecting on the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, the goal is to rightly identify the doctrines that come from God, right? Rather than doctrines that come from man. Irenaeus, likewise, it was an early church leader in the 100s from France, and this is what he said. You'll see it on the screen as well. The gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public and at a later period by the will of God, handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and the pillar of our faith. What's he saying? Both the oral tradition and then what was written became what we know as our scripture today. And this is what we call the ground and pillar of our faith. That is the truth about Jesus was taught by the apostles passed along to the churches and eventually was written down to become what we recognize as the Bible today. Now, as the scripture or as the church sought to recognize what was true about Jesus, right? The written records and the oral tradition together, when rightly understood, take on this name, this group uh, of ideas called the rule of faith or the rule of truth. In many ways, it was a summary expression of how to rightly talk about the Christian faith and how to rightly interpret the Bible. As this began and progressed over time, what we see are things like creeds that come up, like the Apostles' Creed, right? It's a summary statement of the Christian faith. And so Irenaeus refers to this as the only true and life-giving faith. And so when we think about why can we trust the Bible in history, we can just trust it because Jesus affirmed the Old Testament, Jesus promised the New Testament and we understand the formation of the canon and where our truth about Jesus came from, okay? But I also want you to see something else today. I want you to see why you can trust the Bible in life. Why does it still apply for you today? And it's ultimately this, because you can trust Jesus. In fact, the story of Christianity is all of the Bible, is what we read earlier. It's all about Jesus Christ, as the solar system revolves, our solar system revolves around the sun, right? So all of Christianity revolves around Jesus. And so for you today, the question is, do you trust and follow Jesus? Look back with me at Luke chapter 24. We didn't finish the passage. I wanna keep reading. There's some really important things that come out here. Look at verse 28 with me, Luke 24, starting at verse 28. They came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going further. But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now it was as he reclined at the table with them that he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned 
to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and appeared to Simon. And then they began to describe what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. So a few things for you to notice here that are really significant for your life. Listen, first notice that he came to reveal himself. He is ready for you to discover who he is. He wants you to know him. It also points that they asked him to stay and what did he do? He stayed. He is willing to stay and be a part of your life if you invite him to be a part of that. And their eyes were open to see him. That is, he is able to help you see and understand the power of his good news, that he can save you from your sins and bring you into the family of God. What this is talking about is John chapter one and John chapter three, that you need to be born again, that the Holy Spirit has to come into your heart and transform you in such a way that you believe this good news because in and of ourselves, we cannot do that on our own. We want you to see the beauty and the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ. We want you to know his work in creation as the son of God. We want you to know his love in establishing an eternal promise to redeem his people from their sins. We want you to know the promise of his coming for thousands of years. We want you to see the fulfillment of that in his incarnation, that he was born of a woman and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We want you to see his sinless life so that he could be the substitute for your sin. We want you to see his miracles how he healed the blind, the lame, and the sick and raising the dead. We want you to see his promises and his teaching which call you to repent and to believe the good news and to turn from your sins. We want you to see his sacrificial death so that you wouldn't have to pay the penalty for your sin, but he paid it instead. We want you to see his burial, that he was dead for three days. We want you to see his glorious resurrection, that he rose from the dead by the power of God to show his power over your sin and over the death that you face ahead of you. We want you to see his appearing to the disciples to confirm his power and his plan for his people. We want you to see his ascension into heaven, his impending return that he will come again to judge the living and the dead and his work now that he is interceding for you and preparing a place for you. Why do we want you to believe this? Because friends, we all have sin. We all have burdens. We all face loneliness and fear. And we all feel the sting of sickness and death, don't we? And many of you in this room, listen, you are searching for relief. You're searching for some sort of hope that will help you alleviate this human condition. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. You're looking for Jesus and he forgives all of your sins and relieves all of your burdens. And he promises to be with you always and to help you not to be afraid. He solves your greatest foe, sin and death. And he gives you purpose and meaning in this life and in the next. This is the Jesus we want you to know. This Jesus will change your life. He will take you from the city of destruction and bring you out of the pit of despair. He will help you through the hills of difficulty in the swamp of dejection and depression. He'll spare you from the pursuit of vanity and the trap of lucre. He will be with you in the darkest moments of humiliation and suffering while providing you with rest and renewal. And he will lead you to the celestial city, the new heavens and the new earth. Friends, the call for you today is to come and follow this Jesus. That's the whole point of what we do in chapel week to week, all semester long, every semester is to see the beauty and the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ. So the question, if you have not believed Jesus today, if you have not followed him, what good reason do you have not to do that today? What good reason do you have? If you're a Christian, man, give thanks, celebrate, worship the Lord because of what he has done, that he reveals us to us himself in his word by the power of his spirit. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. But for non-Christians is is this, call on Jesus today. Grab Skylar, myself, Emily, faculty or staff member, we would love to pray with you about what it means today, today, to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together and respond to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word, thankful that you show us that we can trust you, that Jesus, that you are good, that you love us, that you have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. And you are interceding for us, preparing a place for us. And so Lord, for those who are far from you this morning, would you help their hearts to see your beauty, your glory, your majesty, that you would pull us up out of the pit and set us on the way of holiness. God, for those of us that are Christians in the room, would you strengthen us, empower us by your spirit to give an answer for the hope that we have. 
God, we love you. We're so thankful for all that you have done for us. We're so undeserving, but you're so good and so kind and so gracious. And so we praise you today in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand, let's sing and worship our Lord and King.
want to thank you so much for being here today, for ending our series.